So we're going to show you off with uh, this wall that we created here while we were using our LiDAR sensor to test our environment. So this is a wall that's just made out of really cheap materials, so it's supposed to be a method of showing how low-cost uh, implementation of messing with the system can then interfere with the LiDAR system to then produce false results or to make the system have a misrepresentation of what's going on in the environment. Uh, what you see in the left and the right are two people. They're going to push the button to keep going. On the left is a small vertical thing. That's how LiDAR sees a person. On the right, you're going to see, we're going to start again. You'll see the two people walking away. And what you see is a wall that's created that lasts for about 20 to 30 seconds. That's con that was the very first revision, which is flour and a couple other compounds in it, which gets suspended in the air. And if you make it thick enough, LiDAR interprets it as a wall. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to show this to you first to provide some context for what's happening. So go ahead, get it forward, let's let it run. And out of nowhere, out of nowhere you see the wall coming up there. See it's spreading slowly, the people are walking away slowly from it, and it's just hanging in the air. And it looks like a solid object, as you'll see us when we talk later. And the idea is you can create, that was the first generation, now we're up to the third generation of powder, which has an even better hang time. So just by, with your hands, throwing something in the air, you can create an object for an autonomous vehicle. Okay, now second. Go. So uh, just a quick overview of the disclaimer. Um, anything seen here, uh, if you, you all would like to try it or replicate it, uh, just do so responsibly. Um, I'd also like to throw it out there that uh, a lot of this is OSI layer level one. Um, so um, we did do some traditional cybersecurity work. Um, however, a lot of it, or the things that were exploitable potentially, uh, could brick the device. And it was $8,000 $8, for one, and it was the only one we had. So not only did we not have $8,000 to break, but uh, we also only had one device to test. Um, so with that, uh, we'll continue. So our project is Tell Me Lies, Automotive LiDAR and Low-Tech Obfuscation. Uh, this is partnered with Capital Tech University, uh, Hawk Cyber LLC, and ASP Global LLC. Um, the squad, this is our group. Um, unfortunately, Mike B couldn't be here today, but uh, he was a great help on the project. Um, uh, Ola, right here behind me. Uh, we have Cyrus, Cyrus right here. And then we have Elijah, Rick, and then me, I'm Brett. Uh, abstract, professor? This was trying to determine what you could do, what we call layer one, which is the signals you receive passively, which means we didn't ha inject any energy into it. And the idea is, what if you had an opponent who could use only readily available parts that were not technology-based? And the theory was, as we'll show later, there are significant issues with the algorithms used to safely drive autonomous vehicles of any kind. And we're going to show you some background in other systems where you've had that. And we've got cases where, for example, using uh, particular shapes where a human being in a trash bag disappears from the view of the LIDAR until it's too late. You're within a factor of 10 to 20 feet before you, can, you would spot it as a significant obstruction. The wall over there, obviously, after... 10, 20, 30, 40 seconds will dissipate, but for that time, the car is going to come to a stop. And we can all think of the issues that would cause. And as we said, layer one, that's an area where uh, we're doing some research. A lot, that's changing the voltage on a network cable. That's absorbing an RF signal selectively so it changes its characteristics. In this case, it's literally throwing very fine dust in the air and seeing certain size particles provide a greater return. So you want something that hangs there, but it's also a big enough particle that provides a great return. So it's very hard to uh, predict how an AI machine learning algorithm is going to handle an obstacle like that. We're going to show you some examples of other things where they've had trouble. So interesting bit of research, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you. So on the left, you can see like a typical cybersecurity practice, you know, coming up with some very complex solution to an issue. It may work, it may not. In this case, uh, it didn't work. But on the right was our team, which was basically drug him, hit him with, with a $5 wrench and um, until he tells us the password. 
and low tech wins for sure. Um, the methods we used in this uh, presentation could essentially be used by anybody who doesn't, doesn't necessarily have a lot of technical skills if they have a little bit of physics knowledge and also can think critically. Um, and it's even very cheap too. Uh, so even people in third world countries could, you know, uh, test this with uh, self-driving vehicles. Uh, again, traditional cyber um, requires knowledge of industry standards, um, programming skills, system administration, uh, etc. And again, this project uh, necessarily didn't, although we did have some uh, traditional cyber findings as well, uh, which were the web interface contains an unvalidated file upload uh, area, um, which essentially you could play around with the firmware uh, because it's flashed without code signing before the device is in operation. Um, so essentially this is more of a proof, proof of concept because although we found this issue, we couldn't necessarily test for it because uh, we would have been throwing away $8,000, so we do accept donations uh, if anybody would like to assist in this project. Um, also the system config could potentially again be vulnerable to XXE. Uh, this is another traditional like cyber finding uh, that wasn't just the physical pen testing we did. Um, and then Nmap revealed an open telnet port um, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, so potentially you could tell that into the device as well. Uh, again, what we did doesn't require industry knowledge or certification or real technical experience. And you know, in a real life situation, uh, maybe a bus, automated or self-driving bus is driving down a highway and somebody just throws a powder off of a bridge, or maybe there's construction and dust gets blown. Um, there's no way to tell, um, you know, who if somebody threw powder or it was you know, construction or what. So it would be very hard to catch somebody doing something like that. Um, so I'll pass that off to Cyrus. Oh. For the donation, it's $50,000 50, or more, by the way. So for the layer one attacks, we had to analyze two threat surfaces. The, the first would be us physically connecting to the device, and we would have to uh, test with NMAP or Burp Street or, you know, security uh, accredited industry tools that are used in traditional cybersecurity, but then, you know, there's also the other threat surface of the physical sensor itself, how the sensor receives the data from from external output, and, you know, how we can manipulate that, you know, uh, the, the, the sensor used in these cars, it's a, a 904 mm, nanometer, sorry, infrared sensor that, you know, even the smallest spec would be picked up. So if we had something that could create a cloud that's thick enough, it would come by as a wall. As you could see on the previous slides, like a human is even less dispersed than, than the cloud itself. So you know it could it could even detect it as a as something even more solid than a human or a baby carriage, for example. So it could be a dangerous thing. Yeah. In the digital world, you think of a pulse as something that looks like this. Very square, very sharp, very well defined. When you go ahead, when something comes back, what makes this all possible is you have to do a lot of digital, lot of digital signal processing to separate the signal from the noise. And that means it makes assumptions about what's real and what's not real. So you'll have something that's very weak, a very interesting, uh, interesting return coming back, and then the AI and machine learning has to go ahead and figure out was that really a signal? Was that really noise? And, and these, these sort of systems amplify when you inject noise in there. For example, the proper sized dust, the proper sized uh, surface that absorbs light so that you could accidentally hide a system. See in the road. For example, an airplane or a car sends out pulses, builds a map that shows its environment. And it watches how things move and it decides, is that benign? Is it coming toward me? Do I have a clear path? And it seems pretty simple. Here's one of the most expensive projects in recent history for self-driving. It's an F-16 airplane. It was flying over clear water at 100 feet. The only difference was there was a very slight breeze, which caused ripples in the water, which caused the same type of noise we're talking about here. And the plane decided it would be a good idea at 100 feet above the water to bend over and aim straight at the water and take the pilot down in about a 1G turn, you know, headed, toward the, headed toward the water. 
that, that means 600 knots airspeed, 100 feet above ground level. Wasn't turning, sitting there testing the terrain following system. And it's really the algorithms we use which make all this possible. Looking at our friends at Tesla, who everyone knows is way, Tesla has a problem with red fire trucks. They use AI machine learning to use visible light to determine their environment. And is they have a problem as Wired Magazine, this is from Wired Magazine, with red fire trucks. There have been a number of crashes involving Tesla where they have an algorithm that's trying to discriminate between the surroundings and the red fire truck. And there's a small issue. But the other side of it is there's Volvo and what's called pilot assist. If a car is in front of you and it switches to the left lane and you are going slower than you want, it will your car will automatically accelerate even if there was a car stopped in the road. And if you look there, that's a desired behavior. If you read the manual, so if your car, someone swerves left to avoid a car, your car may accelerate and go into it. Once again, it's the human programming, the algorithm that doesn't sufficiently understand the complex environment. And that's what makes these kind of attacks possible. So after all this information, like we could see that uh, you can manipulate the sensors with physics, different types of powder, different types of uh, density within the powder, and you can use different colors and different uh, different hues or the spectrum itself. You could just uh, so we tested this. We did a bunch of tests with different colors, surfaces, and uh, yeah. Okay. If you look at the top, the old F-117 fighter, you notice has angles on it. And it's also black. One of the interesting features is if sun isn't shining directly on it, you can't tell whether it's going up or down. You can't see any features on it because light gets reflected away. It looks like a black hole in the sky. And we'll show you we did some experimentation with different types of trash bags to find one with the right color that could be held at the proper angle like they have there, which causes light to get, ref get when light comes to it, it gets reflected away from it, the laser light, and that doesn't get, that which doesn't get reflected away, a significant amount of it gets absorbed, which means to have seen me at 600 feet away, the distance shrinks down to 10 to 20 feet. So here uh, in the photos uh, on the left you have me holding a box with uh, DVDs uh, taped to it. Uh, the bottom side of the DVDs actually absorb uh, the lasers from the LiDAR. And then on the right uh, you have uh, Rick and Ola. Ola's the one in the trash bag. Um, and you'll see later on we have a video uh, showing um, how the sensor was reacting to that as well. And then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on the left, you have our version of the stealth bomber. Uh, this was our budget stealth bomber. Um, so that was Cyrus laying down in the trash bag. Um, wasn't able to detect him. Uh, picture in the middle is the car we used to test uh, the LiDAR on top. Um, and we were testing, I believe, that was confetti in that photo. Um, and that also was blocking the sensor as well. Um, so it showed like a wall as soon as it was thrown up. Very, very um, short duration. Yeah, very, very short duration, so that's where we ended up coming up with uh, other types of powders and things to test as well. Um, and then on the far right, you have Ola again and the professor again. Uh, however, this time Ola was walking into a wall, so I thought I'd throw that in there as well. Um. Uh, so this is a <clears throat> excuse me. This is a list of all of the things we went through. So now we're going to rate them on at their uh, level of danger that they pose to everyday functionalities. Um, which one is it? Go back to the first. All right. So this one is the. So this one you'll see that um, on the far left side, uh, that is if I remember that, that's me. And that's us throwing things into the street. Uh, on the bottom, you have the measurements of uh, danger, not danger, of relativity, how close things are, and how the lidar is reading them. Of course. Uh, is this uh, 
30 seconds, real quick one thing. When you see this start moving, blue means it's a low strength return. It, the LIDAR is gained that's the minimum strength it can detect something. So if something's blue, it means it's have, not getting much light reflected back from it. And so what you'll see is when things are close, they'll turn from, oh, it's blue. As the person walks away, you'll see them turning. All of a sudden, they'll just be gone. So whereas you and I staying there will move away, it will still be blue, just a little bit weaker. Using the right surfaces at the right angle, it disappears very, very quickly. And uh, just again to clarify, uh, the hallway we're in here, it was about 50, 50 feet long. So imagine you're on a highway um, going like 60 miles per hour uh, to stop at 50 feet. Just suddenly, you, you wouldn't be able to. Um. And you'll notice in, Mr. in Professor Hansen's hand here, he has a little plastic uh, black plate. That's also just another material that just happens to not register very well with the LiDAR sensor. And that's me in the trash bag. So then you'll see as we get farther away how uh, how it will be less noticeable within the point cloud. So if we had two sensors, then that would provide more data to work with. But it, you could still see what's going on in this environment. Still there. Why don't you go ahead and stop right about there? Point out, you can still see you and I, still see me and I. Do that. So you'll you'll still see Professor Hansen here, but then you you'll notice that it's really hard for to see me inside of the trash bag. Gotta hurry up. So this is the test that we just showed you in the beginning of the of our presentation, just showcasing our powder test. So it's me driving the Fiat, Cyrus is controlling the LiDAR sensor, and then Elijah threw the, threw the powder for us. And you see how long it lingers and how it creates a, a LiDAR shadow. So while that's being registered, everything behind that is not. So then, like that situation with the, the Volvo, it, it's, it's anonymous. Uh, it's, it's similar to one another since if, if it's registering a wall, then it doesn't notice what's behind it. So if it makes a decision based off of what it first saw, then that could have disastrous cons consequences depending on what's going on in that situation. We already showed you the confetti. Good job. So that's Professor Henson right there in a trash bag near the side of the road. We're not allowed to go uh, on the road while testing with the car because, you know, there's like insurance liability and whatnot. So he took that on for us, and then we have this video showing the data from that present, from that <laughs> from that experiment. So this is me in the, driving the Fiat, Cyrus controlling it. There's a little car over here, and then where the mouse is right here, that's actually Professor Hansen. So he's blended into the background, actually. It's only once you get a little bit closer, that's when you actually see some of the distortion. So we're going to turn back. We're going to make a U-turn right here. So there's just some shrubbery and trees in the building. Then now we're going to turn back around. We're going to head back towards Professor Hansen. He's going to be on the left side. So right over here. Can you pause it back on that? Okay. So they can see. Yeah, be ready to tap it. So he's right there. So it's really hard to see him in relation to the to the environment, which is more disastrous if, when you're dealing with higher speed situations. So here's our final ranking of all the different materials that we worked with. The organic powder was the best because of how long it lingered and how it created uh, ins almost an instantaneous wall to the LiDAR system. The, the shopping bags we used, there, were, there was this thing where we found out that Home Depot bags are pretty good at absorbing some of the spectrum of light that's produced by LiDAR sensors. But in that, for our case, 
it depends on the angle of approach. So it wasn't really that effective. And then the CD disc, that was okay, but that's it's more of a stationary object. And maybe if you like broke them apart and made like a just I don't know, just glue it onto something, I don't know, maybe that could be a little bit better. And the confetti, although it did create a wall of us in a sense, it didn't linger very long, so it wasn't really that effective. And we have also tried other like uh, pieces of black plastic, like that little uh, plastic plate. That was pretty effective, but it would be hard to use that in a quick sense without leaving evidence and whatnot. And for the black spray paint, although that may not be as useful on trying to cover up a material, it could be useful in just spraying like a LiDAR sensor. So if you're targeting someone, you could cover up their LiDAR sensor, so that takes out one of their sensors for whatever vehicle they're using or a drone. So that's another attack vector. For that, we propose a hydrophobic spray, so then it will not allow water or oil-based uh, paints to stick onto a sensor, since it usually has glass on the outside. What's this? So in conclusion, there are a number of ways that an attacker could use low-tech and really low-cost uh, materials or everyday things to, in, to interact with a LiDAR sensor in order to help it, in order to not, well, not help it, to help it misunderstand its, under, its environment. So if a system is heavily using a LiDAR system, then it will be harder for that system to be able to react positively in an environment if an attacker is using some of these type of methods or more or, or more effective methods like a like a well placed uh, cannon of some sort with a specific type of nozzle. Yeah. Now, this is the as is state, which was explaining what ki kind of chaos you could inject into a system using simple materials available to you. We did not illuminate it with 904 nanometer light. Which is readily available from other sources that'll make it more that'll make it give a bigger return in effect. We didn't haven't had time yet to also put a little bit of what's called chaff in there, small pieces of wire to give you a radar reflection. The current generation Priuses use laser and radar together, lidar and radar together for speed. Now if you'll check the the one of the big problems is a lack of sophisticated processing on the LIDAR and radar. I'll have better data on that when we're able to get some active analysis on there. In a military system or in a police system, you'll, you'll code the signal. You'll have a number of pulses as specific spacing that identifies the signal. That appears to be lacking now in these systems, which means we don't know what's going to happen when you get three or four hundred of them in a city block in a traffic jam as well. So this is, once again, what would happen to it just with things you could buy at the grocery store. And does this really work? Um, there's a, a motorcycle called a Goldwing, and there's one with 101,000 miles on it that's been tested in many uh, LiDAR encounters. You can cut the LiDAR detection range from 2,000 feet down to under 400 feet by coating the reflective surfaces. Um, you can also, there are things you can use which are meant to jam LiDAR, which uh, single point surface LiDAR. And if you were to send this through a, a small reflective cloud, it would cause the cloud to appear illuminated in a much wider spread because there's no pulse coding. So you send a pulse out, you get a pulse back, as opposed to sending a group of spaced pulses and getting something back. Further research in the fall, if all comes out right, we're going to be able to have some better test equipment and hopefully for a, a short-term loan of two LIDARs, we're going to test it in a real stereo, stereo vision type environment with the active things that a more knowledgeable attacker would employ. And they're going to include seeing what you can do with limited uh, because we've got a very small size area we're allowed to do GPS research because of the potential for interference. We've got a very small test range for this. We're going to see if you have an autonomous vehicle with which self-guided it's using radar and LIDAR and seeing if there's what I call low budget, under $1,000 attacks you can do to go ahead and cause great issues with an autonomous vehicle. So yeah, like we said, like do not do this unless you have the money to do it and you're having the funding like we do. Well, not that much funding, but still. Uh, 
and then also we had the we didn't have enough stuff to test like the organic powders we, we were trying to get really fine wheat which is there's a whole scientific process to getting really fine wheat and there's a whole danger about uh, combusting into just really small dry particles so you know we we wanted more equipment we wanted more stuff to test and if we had that we could do a more uh, conclusive proof of concept on this so. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity, and uh, we're really glad we could uh, share this information here at DEF CON. This is uh, some of our first time here, so really excited. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, good job, sir. I don't know how to tell you this, but good job. Thank you, sir. And thank you, and give these young gentlemen credit. They did a lot of very hard work trying a number of different substances. And for someone asked, I heard some of the crowd ask, how does a CD re uh, reflect visible light and absorb infrared? The answer is that they use an infrared laser to, to burn holes in the CD and to read the CD. It's designed to trap light. It's a little uh, photon trap in there. So it would look totally silver to you and me, but at that particular frequency of light, it's invisible. So it's a little conundrum. I don't know um, what sort of chaos could be done with that information, but I'm sure you'll think of it. Thank you.